Okay, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, intro introduce Professor uh, Zheng Wei Liu from uh, Beijing University, uh, from Tsinghua University. It is uh, uh, Tsinghua University and uh, Beijing Institute of Mathematical Science and Publications. He will talk about uh, quantum Fourier analysis. Okay, let's welcome. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and it's my great pleasure to give a talk in the Global Young Community of Geometry Seminar. Uh, first, I'm sorry that this talk may not be that related to geometry, but at the end, uh, we will get to non community geometry you know, in a time model. So just please be patient to that point. Uh, well, I'm, I will mainly talk about quantum free analysis in this talk. And uh, so I think we are all familiar with free analysis. And so in, for this community, I think quantum somehow means non-commutative. You can consider it as polynomial algebras, operative algebras. And we are somehow learning the free analysis on some quantum symmetries. Well, usually we study analysis on polynomial algebras as kind of abstract harmonic analysis. So the key point is in another setting called subfactor theory, we not only have one polynomial algebra, but a pair of polynomial algebras. And then we can set up free duality. And then we can ask for free analysis. And that leads to a very rich subject we consider as the uh, quantum free analysis. Well, quantum free analysis in general it's a subject that combines an algebraic free transform, or pictorial in some cases like subfactors, with analytic estimates. And this pro provides interesting tools to investigate phenomena such as quantum symmetries. And for the, uh, for the reference, I would refer to the recent paper by Arthur Jeffrey, Chunan Jiao, myself, Yin Xiang Ren, and Qi Sun Wu. It's published at PNAS in 2019. And you can find further references there. But well, before going to the quantum case, let's recall some classical results back to 1800s. So Fourier first introduced his transformation to solve different equations describing heat. And the key point is the Fourier transform, well, first is defined as this integration. We are familiar with that. And then if we take convolution of two functions, the Fourier transform will change the convolution to multiplications. And the key point is that for different operator like the derivative, if we take the Fourier transform, we get the conjugation of the Fourier transform on that operator, then it becomes the multiplication by the position operator. So the differential equation will be transformed to a polynomial, a polynomial equation. And we know how to solve a polynomial equation. Well, essentially, the Fourier duality can transform a problem in one algebra to another algebra. And sometimes the problem becomes much simpler, something we understand much better. But to get an analysis, we need the p norm on the space. So if we take a function over the real line, and we can take an integration of this magical function ft and absolute value to the p, and then take one over p. And that's the usual p norm for p big or equal to one. And we know the free transform preserves the two norm. That's the Planchet formula. And also it's easy to prove that the, the infinite norm of the free transform of a function f is bounded by the one norm. And this essentially follows from the formula of the free transform is the integration. So what well, obtains the host of an inequality by interpolation of the above two. In general, we have the free transform of f, and this q norm is bounded by the p norm of f. Moreover, we have another inequality for convolution. It's called the Young's inequality. So we take two functions, f1 and f2, and then their convolution, for their convolution, we can compute the R norm. It's bounded by the p norm of f1, the q norm of f2, and subject to the condition p inverse plus q inverse minus i inverse equal to 1 for pqr big or equal to 1. 
So we also consider this as a kind of free analysis since in this inequality, we have two operations. One is multiplication and the other is convolution. And they're three due to each other. So we are understanding the analytic properties related to the two algebraic structure. Like why is convolution here and the p norm is defined for multiplication. So let's move into a slightly more abstract word. Let's say we take a finite group. And then from the finite group, we have two C star algebras. One is the uh, algebra of functions on the group of G with a higher measure. And the other one is the group algebra with a trace tau. But one way to understand that is this abstract definition. So tau is one at identity and zero is at other group elements. Another way to understand that is taking the left regular representation of G acting on itself, and then it becomes a matrix. And the tau is exactly the usual trace of this matrix. And then we can take the abstract map, which is the identity on the group elements. And it's, a, it's a extended linearly as a map from the A algebra to the B algebra. And that is somehow free transform. Now for this free transform, we have defined the multiplication of trace, and then we can induce the convolution. So for the B algebra, it has a multiplication for matrices. Now the pullback by the Fourier transform defines a convolution on the A algebra. And that's exactly the convolution of functions on G. That's a usual way to look at the free duality. But we can do it in the unusual way as well. So on the A algebra, we have the multipl multiplication of functions. And then we can put back that as a convolution on the B algebra. And more precisely, the, we are defining a pointwise product on those matrices. That's called the Hadamard product. And then in both settings, in both A and B algebra setting, we can talk about the free analysis, like the Hausdorff Young inequality and the Young inequality mentioned above. And actually, it's true for both settings. For on the N A algebra, it's the usual free analysis. And on the B algebra, it's the unusual one, but it's still true. So if on the B algebra, both F1 and F2 are matrices, and the convolution is the Hadamard product. And then this R norm becomes a non commutative R norm of this matrix. We can define that by taking the positive operator and the functional calculus. So now let's go slightly more general case beyond the group. So if we take the irreducible representations of a group, so if it's a finite group, then we have finitely many irreducible representations. And then we can take a tensor product of irreducible representations then the tensor decomposes as the direct sum of irreducibles. So this structure forms a ring, and in general, it's called a fusion ring. First, it's a free Z module with a basis x1 to xn, and those bases are somehow the irreducible representations, and x1 is the identity, it's the unit of the ring responding to the trivial representation. And then the multiplication of two gives you this sum with some coefficients, and for representations, those coefficients are always natural numbers. Moreover, there is a, for irreducible representation, it has a dual representation. So that the tensor product contains a copy of trivial representation. So abstractly, we say, okay, if we take the multiplication x, j and x, x k, the multiplicity of the trivial representation is delta j k star. And this is an abstract setting. We call it a fusion ring, first defined by George Lustig. And this also looks like a generalization of the group. So for the group case, we take, when we take the multiplication of two elements in the basis, we get to the third element. And for the ring, we get a sum of the third. And that actually, by a proper normalization, we can say we have two group elements, and it's a convex combination of group elements. And this is called a probability group. In that case, we can replace the coefficient n by positive or non-negative real numbers. 
So now we can ask a similar question from this fusion ring of probability group. We can also derive two different algebras, like the group case. The point is, if we take a group and consider that as a group algebra, then actually we don't remember the group itself. But if we consider that as a half algebra or a pair of sister algebras, then we can remember the group. Here is similar. Take the fusion ring, we can define two algebra. One is somehow function on the ring, that's the A algebra. And the other one is the ring algebra itself. And both algebra are equipped with tracial states, some, some kind of measurements. And definition is similar to the group case. And only one thing we, we need to be careful for the A algebra, when we define the multiplication, is it needs to be modified by a scalar called the, the proof of this dimension. It's a one dimensional representation of the ring or the unique positive character of the ring. And for, B, for the B algebra, well, it's defined in a similar way. The trace of identity is one and the trace of other base elements is zero. Then we take the identity map on the ring basis and take its linear extension we consider that as a abstract free transform from the A algebra to the B algebra. And then the pullback of the multiplications give you the convolution on the A algebra and B algebra. Well, here, uh, the convolution on the matrix algebra is no longer the Hadamard product. It becomes some other kind of weird multiplication. Then we can ask whether the free analysis works on fusion rings. First on, on the A algebra side, it's given by the, the algebra is given by function on the ring. And the convolution is given by the ring multiplication. This is the usual way to look at the algebra or the ring. And then we have the Hausdorffian inequality and the Young's inequality. But it's a bit surprising that if you look at the B algebra, then we need to intertwine the multiplication and convolution. But the host of L inequality still holds on B. However, the quantum analog of the Young's inequality does not hold on B. But this kind of a weird point, we just make a slight more general definition. Like fusion ring is just one more step compared to groups. And then some E inequality doesn't hold. Then it seems like the quantum free analysis is not that reasonable since we just take a slightly more generalization and then it doesn't work well. But fortunately, when we uh, studied this subject, quantum free analysis, we didn't do it in this way. Actually, I'm talking about this in a time reverse direction. What we are doing, we dealing with is actually uh, free analysis on quantum symmetries. And then there are other kinds of examples, not the fusion rings. So here we can ask the question for which kind of fusion ring are the quantum Young's inequality holds. So we have seen that if R is the representat representation ring of a group, then it's true. But if for a general fusion ring, it may not be true. And then in the earlier work, we know if the G, the group G, is a subfactor in general, somehow a pair of phonemic algebras, and all a weak sister half algebra, all the ring is the gross degree of a unitary fusion category, then the quantum Young's inequality holds. So the three things, like subfactor is somehow functional analysis, and the half algebra is algebraic, and the unitary, uh, unitary fusion category is topological. So in different settings, actually, we always have this quantum Young's inequality. So the point is, when we just look at fusion ring, we lose, we lose some important data to study the quantum free analysis. We do need additional structures, somehow quantum symmetries, to establish reasonable quantum free analysis. Well, another very important, important point is, if we just look at the fusion ring, then the quantum Young's inequality is not true. But if the fusion is categorifiable, then it is true. Therefore, 
this inequality becomes an analytical obstruction of categorification. And actually, not only for this Janssen inequality, the quantum analog of true product theory, or some set estimates and several other inequalities provide such analytic obstructions of unitary, categor uh, unitary categorification. And in particular, we actually have a much simpler inequality compared to the quantum Janssen inequality. It's somehow the uh, quantum Janssen inequality for positive operators and the PQR equals to one. And then it reduced to another statement we call the quantum true product theory. So in short words, if we take two positive operators in the A algebra, and then we say their convolution is still positive. This is the quantum true product theory. And this is first approved for subfactors. And for a special subfactor, this statement reduced to the classical true product theory. Namely, if we take two positive metrics, and then we take a hard amount of product, it's still positive. And that's called the true product theory. And we have this uh, more general version in a quantum setting. And then if we apply this theory to the dream field center of the unitary fusion category, then we can produce the following result saying, okay, take the unitary fusion category. It has a ring, the gross leak ring, corresponding to the ring of representations or irreducible simple objects. And then we can compute this character table, like the character table of abelian groups, but here is a more general setting. And then for the character table, we can take the, this sum, the multiplication of three terms, with a denominator. For the group case, the denominator is the proof uh, from this dimension, and it's always one, so we don't see this term. And then for the group case, that means we take the multiplication of three characters and take the trace as positive. And this is exactly the fusion coefficients for group representations. Well, here we are actually using this in the dream field center of the fusion category. And then we know if the urine, if the fusion ring has a categorification, then this positivity holds. But it may not be true for general fusion ring. Therefore, this is an analytic obstruction of unitary categorification of fusion rings. And actually, uh, the obstruction of such categorification is actually rare. There are algebraic ones and number theoretical ones. And uh, my collaborator, Sebastian Pelcox, when, when I told him we have this obstruction, he said, okay, he actually has some fusion rings for several years. And he asked many experts, actually including myself, whether those fusion rings can be categorified. And here is one example in the list. It's a fusion ring and all the proof from this dimension are integer. And somehow the number theoretical obstruction doesn't work for this family. And then for those fusion ring, we can write down the fusion matrix, the seven fusion matrix explicitly. This fusion ring has uh, seven elements in the base, the rock seven example. And for those fusion metrics, the character table is somehow a diagonalization. And it's easy to compute that by computer. Actually, it can also be computed by hand. We have the following seven by seven matrix for the character table. And then we only need to compute the multiplication of three characters, the last one. And then we have this formula and the sum is negative. But the previous theorem said, said if this fusion ring has a categorification, then the sum is positive. So we can eliminate this fusion ring from unitary categorification just by computing this simple linear algebra. But this is, is a question that remains for several years. And now we have a pretty powerful analytic abstraction to eliminate that. And actually, it's, it not only works for this case. Uh, at that point, uh, my collaborator Sebastian has several other examples. And then later, we use the supercomputer to extend the family of its classification of simple integral fusion rings subject to the following dimension. And then we found 34 examples, and four of them are cut, uh, somehow given by representations of finite groups. And 30 out of them are non group like. And now, using this method, we can eliminate 80, sorry, 
28 out of 30 by just this one simple inequality. Somehow we can eliminate 93 percentage. And this is the most sufficient, uh, the most efficient abstraction we have known so far. And it's quite surprising to us. We didn't expect to uh, eliminate somehow eliminate such a large family of examples using this single criterion. Well, uh, you may talk about that. So this abstraction is very powerful. So which kind of tool do we need to prove this inequality? Actually, it's not that complicated. So one thing is the following. In the A algebra and the B algebra, so we have two related by the free duality. There is a pictorial representation comes from the framework called subfactor planar algebra. And in this pictorial framework, we can understand the algebra as a square-like picture. And then we can glue the squares like vertically or horizontally. And these two, these two topological operations corresponding to two algebraic operations. And one is multiplication and the other is convolution. And there's another way to understand this picture using the cobordisms. So we can take the following three-dimensional picture. It can, can be regarded as a surface with two holes on top and one hole at the bottom, like a surface with boundaries. And then we can consider this cobordism as a linear transformation in the framework of topological quantum field theory. And here, different from the usual topological quantum field theory, we can add additional defect lines on the surface, and which we call the surface algebra. So those algebra cooperation actually has a topological meaning. And that's why, that's how it's related to the problem of categorification. So it's essentially we said, if those fusion ring has a topological field theory behind that, then we can use those, those, those topological structure to establish analysis. And then we use the analysis to get interesting inequalities and furthermore some analytic abstractions. So in, in particular, if you consider one direction for multiplication and the other direction for convolution, then actually, the free transform also has a very beautiful diagrammatic representation. It's the 90 degree rotation. And then in planar geometry, we know the 90 degree rotation intertwines the horizontal and the vertical direction. And then here actually that tells the free transform intertwines the convolution and the multiplication. And moreover, the 90 degree rotation has periodicity fault. So actually it's the case for this quantum free transform. But actually here, one more comment. In a general planar algebra setting, we can take a diagram with like six bounding points or two n bounding points. Then we can have another kind of free transform with periodicity two n. It also has interesting free analysis. But for this talk, we don't go to the details of that direction. So now let's come back to this uh, key result, saying the convolution of two positive operators is still positive. This is the one we use as the analytic abstraction of categorification. But now if we use the pictures mentioned above, those two dimensional pictures, we can give a very short proof of this result. So we take the operator as a square, and then it's a positive operator means we can take the square root of it using functional calculus. And then we can say x is a multiplication of square x and square x. And here multiplication is given by this vertical gluing map. And then the convolution is a horizontal map. So now after decomposing x and y into square roots, we can draw a line in the middle. And then the picture on top is the mirror image of the picture in the bottom. And then what's the meaning of the mirror image in Operator algebra is a joint operation. So that means this picture is an operator, no matter what it is, it's an operator multiplied as a joint. So it's a positive operator. And this is the very short proof of this positivity of convolution. 
and then just run this result on the Dreamfield Center of our canonical construction, then we get an analytic construction, a very short proof. So in general framework, the subfactor theory has a very wide connection in mathematics and physics. And first, it's originated in the setting of operating algebras, but then lead to connections in quantum groups, representation theory, not theory, where Wong, found, Wong just found his Jones polynomial. And also lower dimensional topology, category theory, some physical physics, quantum field theory, and actually many other fields in recent years. And the quantum free analysis adds an actual dimension to those connection, connections. So a very important point is subfactor theory has those very rich connections. And once we can establish those free analysis for subfactors, then we can transform the results to several other subjects. And here is a picture that when Wong, Wong won his uh, first medal at the SCM in 1990s for those breakthroughs. So for quantum free analysis, we work on various quantum symmetries. And subfactor is a central topic that can be transformed to other stuff through known connections, like Cassie algebras and locally compact quantum groups for the infinite dimensional case, and some topological, topological case like plane algebra, surface algebra, topological quantum field theory, or some categorical uh, terminologies like fusion category, modular tensor category, or two category, and so on. And also something related to uh, statistical physics, the many box system, and quantum informations. And here in this talk, I will give you what is subfactors, but not the other terminologies. And that's the one coordinate. We have those quantum symmetries. And the other coordinate is those analysis. We have a lot of interesting inequalities related to free analysis. And we want to have the quantum analog of those inequalities for various quantum symmetries. And in a, in a series of papers, uh, joined with Kai Feng Gu, As Jeffy, Chunlan Jiang, uh, myself, Sebastian Palcock, and Jin Song Wu, and actually several others, uh, we formalized and proved the quantum analogs of the following inequalities. So we mentioned the uh, short product theory, this convolution positivity. And we mentioned the Hausdorff inequality, Yang's inequality. And actually, we have various uncertainty principles for bonding entropy, relative entropy, and several other entropies. And also, an interesting estimate called some set estimates in additive combinatorics. And recently, we also established the Loomis Whitney inequality. And this is a very important inequality for convex geometry. And now we have a quantum analog. So that could be something very interesting. And actually, the proof rely on quantum information theory, some classical results in quantum information theory. And we also characterize the extreme measures of those inequalities. And for Loomis Whitney one, uh, we, we just obtained this uh, proof in the general case last week. And uh, very key and beautiful point is given by Kai Feng Bu. And other than those known results, uh, not known results, but somehow known inequalities, now we have quantum analogs. We also formulate some other new inequalities. Like we know the central limit theorem is very important in classical uh, analysis. And now we can establish a two dimensional version of central limit theorem. Somehow we consider the classical one as a one dimensional central limit theorem. And this is a more general setting. And now we can prove that for subfactor plane algebras. And this is even new for the group Z mod two. It's a very simple example, but actually the 2D central limit theorem is very rich. And uh, we can set up the statement for real lines for function, like Shiraz function on reals, but still it's open. And also this is a kind of rare, we have very simple statement for Shiraz functions, and, uh, but uh, it remains open. Now let's get to a bit more details 
on subfactor theory. So what is the quantum symmetry we are considering in general? That's a subfactor. So what's that? First, a factor is a fundamental algebra with trivial center. And here we consider the called type two one factor. It has a trace and it's infinite, infinite dimensional. And we need this trace as a measure to do analysis. So one example is we can take the uh, infinite tensor product of two by two matrices and then define a trace just by the tensor product of the usual trace. And it's a tracial state. Then by the GNS construction, we will obtain a fundamental algebra that is actually a uh, two one factor. And this is uh, called a hyperfinite two one factor. Well, then what is sub factor? A sub factor is simply an inclusion of, of two factors. So, why this is interesting is uh, go back to the early construction of Maria von Neumann. Here we take the two by two tensor product, but actually we just take a even the limit of some matrix algebras, then it always gives the hyperfinite for the algebra. So hyperfinite factor is a very rich topic that contains a lot of interesting finite symmetries. And then the point is we don't remember the finite symmetry. Like if we take a group, we can take different groups and then build the group algebra. And then maybe isomorphic, it's hard to get back to the uh, group itself. So for factor is similar, we can take different limits of finite dimensional matrix algebra of finite dimensional symmetries. Then it gave this universal one, the hyperfinite factor. Now, if we want to recover that, we need to define a group action or in general quantum group action on the factor that gives you a subfactor. And the bigger one is the cross product of the smaller one by the group. Well, in general, this group, well, we just define the index of the subfactor is somehow the order of the group. But in general, just show that the order of this group may not be integer. So it's kind of quantum group. And he gave a complete, complete classification of this just index. And above four, it can be arbitrary value. Below four is a discrete series, it's quantized. And this indeed relates to quantum symmetry and further to quantum field theory. Now, let's see, given this kind of uh, two, a pair of uh, one name algebras, how do we get somehow half algebra or pair of sister algebras? Like the A algebra and B, B algebra we, we mentioned before. So first, given the sub factor, uh, we can construct a bi module. So M is a factor with a trace, so it, it's also a Hilbert space. And then this Hilbert space has a left action by NN and the right action by, by M. So it's an NN by module. And then it has a dual by module, like the dual representation. Just by the same space, but the left action by M and the right action by N. So these two are two sister algebras with trace, and the trees are induced from this unique trace of the two one factor. And then we can take the tensor product of those bimodules that's called the Coase fusion and look at the home, home uh, bimodule maps, the home space of the tensor product. And if we take x times x up, we get one C style to A. And if we take x up times x, then we get a C style to B. And they, in particular for the group case, if we take the factor R and the gross product, cross product of the factor by the group G, and then the A algebra is the function on the group. And the B algebra is the group algebra we mentioned at the beginning. And moreover, the unique two and trace is exactly the same as the trace we defined at the beginning. So in this way, we can recover the group symmetry and its free analysis from the free analysis on subfactors. So somehow subfactor, like for name algebra is a generalization of group algebra. A subfactor is the generalization of group algebra as half algebra. And then we can study the quantum free analysis on subfactors. And this actually leads to worse categorization of intermediate subfactor. And by definition, it's sim simply a, a factor in the middle of the two factors. It's Q between 
n and then for finite index subfactor, and you reduce for means the commitment of n in m is trivial, and then we can get some interesting results for coming from the free analysis. If you take an intermediate algebra, which may not be a style algebra, not necessarily invariant under the joint operation. And then we can say it's automatically a style algebra and it's actually automatically an intermediate subfactor sub if the algebra is a familiar algebra. And this is actually a very interesting phenomenon. Say somehow if you have an operator in the middle, you have algebra in the middle, then it's still is always there. And he, you can consider this phenomenon on the group. Like if you have a finite group, you take a Y element and you take a multiplication of the element with itself, eventually you get back to its due, the inverse of this group element, somehow the star of the group element. But this is true for the finite group. It's not true for the infinite group, like Z plus. It's a semi-group of Z. It's close under multiplica the multiplication, but not close under the inverse. And another example is the two by two matrix. You can take the upper triangular matrix. It's closed under multiplication, but not under star. So actually both the finite index condition and the irreducible condition are necessary in the above theory. And this is a more general phenomenon. Namely, you take a subfactor N in M and you, if it's finite index and irreducible. And then if you take an element in M and you take the multiplication of this element with n, you consider n as the field, somehow non commutative field. And then you take operator in m, you just repeat the multiplication of itself, then finally it will recover m of this operator, the, the joint of this operator. And some other interesting apl application is the following. Uh, for the intermediate subfactors, it's just, just like groups. You can take a union and the intersection, and then they form a lattice. And what Tani proved that the lattice is finite for irreducible subfactors with finite index. And then Robert Longo gave an upper bound for the size of lattice. It's the Jones index square to the Jones index square. And then he conjectured that the size can be bounded by the Jones index to the Jones, Jones index in 2003. And then uh, in recent work, joint with cash up, dust, and rain, uh, we can actually show a much better bound is nine to the mu to the Jones index. So we can change the base to constant uh, using the methods in quantum free analysis. And the key point is that we can give an angle, we can characterize the an angle between in irreducible subfactors, intermediate subfactors, and the angle is between 60 degree and 90 degree. This uniform angle gives this uniform base nine, independent of the Jones index. And those maps are also these two uh, interesting and actually highly natural classification in subfactor theory. Well, uh, we mentioned actually a lot of interesting inequalities, and those they works for subfactors. They actually works for other settings like. Uh, uh, Cassel algebra is locally compact or quantum groups. And another very interesting part is when we prove those inequalities, we use topologies. Like in the example before, we proved the quantum true product theory. Say the convolution of two positive operators is positive. We use the diagram. And also we prove those like Hausdorff inequality. We do need the definition of the Fourier free transform to be a 90 degree rotation in plane algebra is somehow topological interpretation. And on the other hand, we not only use the topology to do analysis, but also the analysis, the same inequalities leads to non-trivial obstruction to the categorification problem. And on backwards. And uh, those in context also has very interesting applications in quantum information since uh, we have those entropic uncertainty principle. And 
under certain transformation, the entropy can be translated to entanglement entropy. And then we can have new uncertainty principle for entanglement entropy. So now uh, I will talk about another direction that we are developing. So in analysis, there's a very important family called the Bryce Campley Leap inequality. It was studied by them in 1976 and it's still very, very active now. So this inequality is actually not one inequality. Instead, it's a very large family of inequalities. So how large it is? The first, it starts with linear transformation Bj from Rn to Rnj, a set of linear transformations. And then for a fixed set of transformations, you, you can take non-negative measurable functions on the space R and J. And then with those parameters Pj, like P inverse plus Q inverse equals one, those kind of parameters. And then you can set up E in quality saying, okay, you take the functions on R and J and then take the pullback of function to Rn using the linear transformation, and then take the multiplication. And the trace is bounded by the P norm of Fj, multiplied by the constant C. And this very general inequality, inequality actually covers Young's inequality, Herd inequality, Loomis Whitney inequality, and many other interesting inequality as special cases. And the best constant, constant C was given by Bennett, Cambry, Christian, and Tao in 2008. And the best constant is obtained at certain Gaussian functions. This is a very important inequality and it essentially uses the convexity somehow and also closely related to the uh, uh, convex, I'm sorry, convex geometry like even for Loomis Whitney in college, that's close related to convex geometry. And then uh, in, I think in 2016, Professor Chen Hua Xu asked me when I give a talk on the topic, he asked whether we can generalize this first complete leap in quality for quantum symmetries. And somehow this may include some example we mentioned above, like the quantum Young's inequality, a quantum hurdle inequality. And here is a hint, how can we do that? So let's see, how do we use first complete leap inequality to recover Young's inequality? This is the one we have for the quantum version. We can take three linear transformations, B1, B2, and B3. B1, B2 are projections on, on the two co coordinates and B3 is the sum map. And the parameter is the following, like one over Pj at the sum two. And then if we write down this first company inequality, we just rewrite the formula, it becomes the integration of three function, the multiplication of three function on the left side. And then by changing the variable, we can rewrite that as a convolution of the two functions and then multiply the third. And then the best function of this inequality will include two parts. One is the Young's inequality, and the other part is the herd inequality. So actually, just this breast complete inequality for this very special choice, it covers Young's inequality and herd inequality. So why this is important to understand the quantum case? Because all the three maps, B1, B2, and B3, can be realized as special cobordisms in topological quantum field theory or quantum symmetries. So then the point is we want to replace those linear transformations by cobordisms, like plane tangle or surface tangle or three manifolds with closed boundaries or even triangulating manifolds by those kind of topological data. So then we can formalize a topological analog of those best complete inequalities. So we replace those linear transformation by cobordisms. And this is one formalization of this breast complete B inequality. And actually, 
for the classic one, it has some parallel version, so you can do the parallel ones. And then we not only study this topological breast can believe in inequality for just R, because we have different kind of quantum symmetry, and R is one kind of quantum symmetry. So for the input for XJ, it's no longer function on R. Instead, it will be an operator in the A algebra. And if you are considering Rn, then it's the A algebra to the tensor power N. And then this A algebra is given by the algebra from a star factor of like C star half algebra or like fusion category, whatever you want. So this is a very general setting. A is quantum symmetry. And the linear transformation, so somehow the R, the real line in the classical case, it's replaced by A, the quantum symmetry. And the linear transformation on Rn is replaced by this cobordism, the topological data. This is a very rich family of inequalities. And then we can ask for the best constant of the inequality. And then in breast can believe there is a very subtle condition. For example, for Young's inequality, we have P inverse plus Q inverse uh, equals I inverse plus one. And then in this setting, how do we understand those, like those, this identity using topological data? And it's actually very surprising. We do have such uh, identity using topological data on the surface when we use surface tangles. So somehow surface tangle is a surface with boundaries and you have additional lines. So you can count the number of vertex and uh, lines and or edge and regions, those data on the surface. And here we have two different colors corresponding to the N and M in the subfactor setting, the two algebra. And also if we switch color, then that switch that corresponding to the free duality. So here we can use those uh, like graphical data or topological data to write down an identity just by counting the number of like, vertex and regions and those parameters P. And the first data you can see, it has this number one. And this is exactly the number one in the identity like P inverse plus Q inverse minus I inverse is equal to one. Well, when we switch the shading, we get another identity using the same set of uh, topological data, but it looks different. And the very interesting part is, okay, here we have two formulas and somehow in the classical case, we only have one formula. So it confused me for a while, why we have two, which one we shall take. And finally, I realized, okay, actually both of them are true and actually they are equivalent. The point is if we take the sum of the two, identity, then it becomes an equality. That the number of vertex plus number of regions minus the number of edge is two, it's one plus one. And that's exactly the Euler formula. So this is a very uh, surprising and exciting point that at this very basic level, this the sum of parameter, the weighted sum of parameters corresponds to the Euler formula in topology. So the basic part or the fundamental part the analysis corresponding to this fundamental part in all the formula that were studied like hundreds of years ago. Now we get a new interpretation or somehow a new usage of this identification in from the quantum case. Now I uh, recall that for the breast camp leap, uh, somehow we are convinced this is the right framework uh, to do the breast camp leap in equality for quantum symmetries. And the one evidence is that for the classical case, the breast can believe includes several inequalities, as we mentioned, like Herder inequality, Young's inequality, Loomis Winter inequality at special cases. And now for the quantum case, we also have the quantum analog of those inequalities. And actually, we can prove them, the special case already. And we know the best constants, we know how to characterize the extreme measures of those inequalities as the special case of the topological breast camp leap. And the extreme measures are also characterized in the natural way. And those are the somehow the, the 
most, uh, not the most interesting, but somehow the very convincing, convincing special case of the general breast cancer relief. So we are very optimal that um, the breast can flee be in collective for quantum symmetry is formalized in the red setting. And uh, can, but computing the best constant and characterizing the extreme matters could be very challenging. And we saw that to be a long-term program. And in particular, recently we got this quantum analog of Loomis Whitney inequality. And this inequality comes from convex geometry in the classical case. And now somehow we get the non-commutative analog of convex geometry. So we consider this as the starting point to study the subject of non-commutative convex geometry. And actually this also has a very interesting connections with uh, quantum information. But uh, we have a careful search so far. Um, so uh, so uh, we, we didn't find uh, the non commutative or quantum analog of this Loomis Whitney inequality. And we think this is a new result. So, in summary, uh, the quantum free analysis leads to new connections between analysis and topology, additional to the already rich connections with the algebra and also with potential connection applications to quantum information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Zoe. Very wonderful lecture. Uh, okay. Uh, any questions from the audience? Any questions or comments? Uh, as for the uh, non-commutative convex uh, convex theory, can, can you show the last slide? Yeah. The previous uh, non convex geometry. Uh, I I notice something which may not uh, be quite relevant. Uh, there's a uh, mm, Young mathematician called um, Matthew um, uh, the, the, the Canadian uh, Matthew what Matthew Kennedy Matthew Kennedy from uh, University of Waterloo. Uh, last time he gave a lecture, also in this. Uh, anyway, anyway, he he he's recently studied the, the so-called uh, not community of convex, uh, convex something, convex set or something. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it's uh, connected to your situation, but there might be something. Well, maybe I can explain this inequality quickly. And uh, actually, uh, since we, we just discovered this, uh, Two days ago, and I didn't have time to prepare for this talk. Otherwise, I will talk more about this, this very interesting inequality. So, what's the meaning of the inequality? Uh, I will talk about the first non-trivial case for uh, R three. So, in a three D dimensional space, we take a measurable site, or just a, like a ball in three D space, and then we can count its volume. Let's say the volume is V, and then we can project the ball into three coordinates. Uh, three like two dimensional subspace, and then we have three areas, say a one, a one, a three, and the inequality is that this volume v square is bounded by the multiplication of a one, a two, and a three. So that's the breast complete be inequality, and it works for higher dimensional case. And the very interesting part is the inequality holds if and only if this ball is a cube. And this has a lot of interesting applications in convex geometry. And actually this was first study in convex geometry. 
and, and it's a very powerful inequality. And later people, people realize this inequality can be proved in a very short way using analysis. And then generalize to the breast camp deep case. Now for the quantum case, I can give you a, a corresponding analog. And for the people who are familiar with like the move from abelian algebra to non-abelian algebra, it's very easy to state. Now, first for the Arbini case, let me simple, simplify the example from the real line to two point. Let's just say one coordinate, for one coordinate, we only have two points. Then for the three dimensional case, we only have eight points. And then we take a subsize of eight points and the volume will be the number. And we can project that to the three subspace and then we count the number and we get the same statement. Now, what's, what do I mean by quantum case? We change the two points like a two-dimensional algebra to the two by two matrix. And then the statement said, okay, if we have a tensor product of two by two matrix, the three-fold tensor product of two by two matrix. So we have eight by eight matrix. And then we can reduce that. So we have matrix T, and then we can reduce one coordinate, and then we get a four by four matrix. So we get T1, T2, and T3. And subsize just means projections. We can assume just T to be a projection. And then the cardinality is the rank. So that means the rank T square is bounded by rank T1 multiplied by rank T2 multiplied by rank T3. And this is quantum analog. And the very interesting part is this equality holds if and only if T is a simple tensor. So somehow if you, you know a little bit about quantum information, you will find this interesting. It tells it has no entanglement. Instead of it's a cube, it tells it has no entanglement. And actually, the proof, we not only prove this one, we also have an entropic version of this inequality. And the proof exactly use uh, entropic inequality in quantum information. And the very interesting part is uh Kaifeng Bu is quite familiar with that part, and he gave a very elegant proof of this, this result just last week. And then now we can do that for a more general version, and we can also characterize extreme measures and several other things. Just um, it's it's really a kind of convex geometry in non-commutative algebra, and it's already non-trivial for matrix algebra. Very nice. Uh, any any question? Any other question? Okay, if in this case, uh, let's thank Zhengwei for this wonderful lecture.